Um, so welcome to our virtual opening. That's one thing that wouldn't be happening at if we were really if physically together at the Kutztown Gallery. I hope that everyone right now has a cheese platter at hand and a sparkling beverage of your choice. I am terribly sorry that I could not provide that for you. It would have been my pleasure. Um, on the other hand, it is nice that we have all of our artists here because if this was actually taking place at Kutztown University in March, there's a great likelihood that we would not have had everyone there at the opening. So that's uh, a good thing that's coming out of it. Um, I also want to uh, thank Karen Stanford. I don't know if she's on here yet for allowing us to hang the show, which as you can see from the little installation photos um, that we're playing. And if you miss those, you can check it out on the website. It looked amazing. Um, we hung it on March, uh, it was right before March 17th. It was scheduled to open. And then something happened and they locked the doors and no one ever saw it hanging up except the janitors and the, um, you know, mice. So uh, it did look amazing. And I think that you can get the sense of um, the amazingness from some of the photographs we took. And also, hopefully, the, um, with this new um, arrangement of having it online, you can get to know even more about our artists and see some other examples of their work and read some of their writing. I think it's a really interesting experience. So tonight we're gonna to hear short little talks, about five minutes each from our group of nine artists in this show. Please feel free if you're an attendee to use the question and answer panel. If you have, if a question pops into your head, we will be able to, um, to read that at the end or to answer those at the end. Um, we'll have a few minutes. We're gonna to try to just keep the whole thing to under an hour. I know other people have other things to do on Friday night. And um, feel free again to browse the website at amoslemon.org backslash the ilk show, which you will see it's the homepage now of the website. So amoslemon.org. So uh, the idea for this show last September, I got to go to this amazing um, artist estate foundation conference. And there was a guy named Chris Derkong, who is a famous um, curator. He was the director of the Tate Museum for a while. And um, he said the challenge with an artist estate is to keep the art from being dead and in the past to being alive and in the future. And um, so that got me thinking about the way that art is in conversation with other art and that artists are in conversation with other artists, even artists from the past. I know that Amos um, had, you know, found that there was something that Egon Scheel could say to him or, you know, Bruce Lutrecht, other artists from the past. And he certainly was engaged in conversations with all of the artists that um, you'll hear tonight. Some of them knew him firsthand. There's the dog again. <laughs> Some of them knew him firsthand, and others, um, I feel like the work influenced each of the people that are here. Uh, but I want this focus I, when I had this idea to do the opening. Um, I got this idea from another uh, similar event that I went to. Um, and really, all I wanted to hear about is what you've been doing lately. So I think that you'll see as we go through the various artists, just show and tell a little bit about what their last few months have been like and um, what they've been producing. You'll be able to see the links in conversation and the common themes. Um, the other question is, I know some people don't know necessarily what is the meaning of the word ilk. So the definition technically is a group of items of the same type. And this group of items um, is the type of artist who I feel like would make a painting in a cave if they were locked in there and all they had was a couple of rocks to scrape together. So that kind of obsession and love for the craft, um, which seems effortless, but is not effortless at all. It takes a great deal of effort. Uh, that was Amos. And that's the common thread that I see among the people that I invited into this show. Um, some of my favorite people. And the other thing that's funny, the word ilk kind of became a an inside joke in our family because we said nobody ever uses ilk with a positive connotation. And this is cousin Eli said, you never hear of like classical composers and that ilk. So this time it's definitely with a positive connotation. These are artists that are similar in some way to Amos. And um, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over. Hopefully I'll be able to share my screen effectively. And uh, we'll start off Mr. Tim Baldwin. 
will be our first speaker. If you want to unmute yourself, let me share my screen here. Oh, okay. There I am. There you go. All right, sweet. Okay, so I want to thank Anne for being a part of the show. Uh, I wasn't expecting to be part of the show or to even present really in this way, but this is where we are today. And I keep hearing every every time I drive my car that we're all in this together. So we are. And uh, I want to talk about my work, uh, the work that I did for the show. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about. I'm going to kind of talk about what I've been up to recently, which I have a studio. This is a picture of my studio. And this is a third story row house from the turn of the 20th century. It's in Fleetwood and it's a great space to work in. I actually lived here right before I graduated from KU in January and I decided to stay due to our current situation. And I'm really grateful that I did because this, these were the types of work that I was working on. So mainly these are small collaged pieces and on the far left, they're the digital composites that are painted on top of the right panels. So these were all receipts from Panera when I worked there to establish my residency before I went to school. And I kept them all. So I decided to make these paintings that were nostalgic to me and kind of told my story. So I used to collect these, I just kept them all. So I decided I'm gonna make paintings about that time and how I work third shift as a baker and how much that just time was devoted to just doing that. Like I just worked at Panera as a night baker and I wasn't making any art for about three and a half years. And right before I graduated, I made these and I intend to finish these because I'm actually very excited about them due to right after graduation, not, you know, continuing to produce, you have to continue to produce. So this piece is a night scene that, um, what I wanted to do was I wanted to create these night scenes that kind of pertain to that time in my life, but make them disorienting and then bring up little details of words from all the receipts that were collaged underneath. And I named these after particularly songs and music that I listened to at the time. And this one's named The Night Shift Is What I've Become, which is actually from the band Some Velvet Morning. Not the song, the band. This is the album cover. And that's pretty much how I felt. The Night Shift Is What I've Become. So it's cathartic for me to make these because it's like, I'm taking my past and making it art and it's a release, it's cathartic. And this is what I saw and it became very disorienting for me to find a direction and what I wanted to do. And then the next piece was, I was very inspired by, and these are small, these are tiny collages, they're 13 by 11 inches. And then the uh, other panels that were on the right screen were larger. They were actually the same size as the pieces that were in the show. So 32 by 32. And that's going to be a big triptych type piece. But this piece is called I Need the Darkness. Someone please cut the lights. And this is a digital composite. So I take multiple photos and layer them over each other. And then I put them on top. So you can see little tiny smidgens like little tiny things in the background of the receipts collaged together. And this was actually taken from a song from this album, The Suburbs by Arcade Fire. I listened to that religiously in high school. And actually, that album was released a year after I graduated from high school. And then recently, I've been... This, this just came out of nowhere. This was just one of those things that COVID happened, and everyone was just, it's like the world kind of stopped. And I've been working on a f organic farm uh, for the past couple months. And I got this statue. I got this, it's just a broken cherub uh, statue that was in, you know, the garden. And I just 
immediately took my graduation robe, I ripped it up, and I put chains around the figure, and it's like it's just staring into your soul, which is what I wanted to do. And this piece is going to be a painting, a foot by two feet, and I'm going to collage on the background, and then I'm going to put, I'm going to layer like um, all of our first responders, healthcare workers, things like that. So this is kind of sat in my head for a long time as far as how to approach this. And I came up with the title for this before I even really started it. And it's gonna be called Wingless because we can't fly away from this. And uh, with that, that's kind of what I've been up to. And that's the space that I work in. And link to my website on the website for the show. So that's all I have, thanks. Great, thank you. That goes by fast, it's kind of crazy. Um, uh, my slides are supposedly advancing by themselves, but if not, I am keeping an eye on the time. So um, on deck, we have Mr. Joshua K. Y. Bolos. And uh, if you're ready to go, then uh, I'll give you the start. Cool, um, first thing, like, Thank you so much, Anne, for organizing this and just like giving everybody a platform to kind of come from their own really personal places with Amos. Like, I think we all really needed that. And for me, that was a certain closure. Um, and um, my name is Joshua Keono Ono Yama Uchi Bulas. Uh, I'm a Hawaiian artist and I'm a current third year at the painting department at RISD. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, um, I guess we'll get into the slides. Um, cool, am I, great, yeah. Okay, so um, this is an iPhone photo that kind of set up, I guess, like the vocabulary of, I guess, the things I'm working with now. The work that I have in this show are drawings that were like tracings of my hand that what I would kind of like fill in. And they were all done in ink. And uh, I think for about a couple of years now, I've been really interested in um, like the symbology of like hands, like what they mean in like corporate advertising and what they mean for um, people. And I think I've been looking at a lot of like healthcare ads and ads that kind of, um, convey a sort of human uh, le legitimacy and reliability and how the hand is kind of uh, an invitation in that. So I started printing out uh, these iPhone photos um, onto canvas and then rendering them in oil paint on top. So there's like a level of photorealism in them and then um, painting abstraction on top. There's like a store-bought quality to, um, I think, a canvas print. There's something that's like really corporate about it similarly to a healthcare ad, and especially who gets access to healthcare, who gets access to original painted works rather than printed artwork. There is like something about authenticity in the greater art world that I think is elitist. And I think that that was like something I was interested in talking about like location. So in each of these paintings, my hand is kind of out in this way. And these are all photos that are taken in Rhode Island. Um, this is another one from that series. This is still ongoing. Um, and I think what was like important to me in this as well is I guess like kind of broadening, I guess like the mythos of the hand in painting. And there's like, I don't know, there's like puns in the work, like having a hand in the artwork. There's just like things that kind of also critique modernism or like m the aesthetic of modernity uh, in the age of like the store bought or the additioned. Um, and so uh, with a lot of these being very photographic and like relying on the photo, uh, some of them are like carefully rendered into with oil paint and then painted over with squares on top. Um, this is like a piece from like an older body of work that I was working on right, right when 2019, like right when 2020 happened, this is in January. And these are like when I switched from canvas to linen and these are all oil and acrylic on linen. And I was like really interested uh, in, I guess like the, the, the grid. And I was looking at a lot of Ed Reinhardt. Ed Reinhardt is a, is a painter who painted abstraction very like tied to trauma and war. And I was like interested in kind of first off 
emulating textiles, but also like maybe speaking about like my own kind of discrepancies with like the world. So I created these characters that are kind of based off of the big pen logo, that like ball headed figure that has like a black head and kind of making an abstraction of it that's slightly phallic, but also like, like resembles something of a sun or like uh, this, like, I guess like the orb of energy that's kind of depicted in a lot of surrealist paintings. Um, this also leads me to like another project that I'm working on right now. And it's like a performance art piece. Uh, I like go, I like DJ under the name Guy Weiwei. And he's like this kind of character who's like really arrogant and self-absorbed and thinks he's like tough, hot stuff. And like, um, he's also a painter, but he's so obsessed with like the canon of music that all his paintings are 12 by 12 inches, which is the size of a record. Uh, sleeve and they're all can they're all printed um, digitally like on custom canvas printing sites and he doesn't touch the paintings afterward and I think like when I was working f as an assistant for an artist when I was painting the paintings for him there's kind of like this ego of like kind of just having something made for you and like the labor of something not showing really your I, I guess like your your blood and sweat into it but I guess maybe the idea of it so Guy Weiwei is gonna install all 14 of his paintings in a room and is gonna do a live DJ set uh, in front of his peers. Um, and this leads me to like my latest work. Um, I was really inspired by Purvis Young, who is a, a black painter from Miami, Florida. Um, and he painted a lot of like, he painted very much about black life in Miami and was um, painting this a lot of like found objects, found wood. And I was um, at the time running uh, a gallery in my apartment called Apartment 13. And we were having a show there that was about dots. And I was also at the time reading a lot about racial housing segregation and how a lot of uh, people of complexion and um, mostly like minority neighborhoods were like kind of did not have the same access to healthcare or like groceries as um, many white people did. And this, this is similarly something happening like in um, Rhode Island. This was made about two weeks before the George Floyd protests when it, you couldn't get COVID testing um, if you weren't for some certain neighborhoods when you're in Providence. So I was making a lot of these things that had to do with like my like my designation as like gallerist but also like me being someone in Rhode Island running a gallery while at the same time people like can't even enjoy kind of art the same way that a lot of art students can because some of them can't even like get healthcare. So this is a series that's ongoing. There's about five of them that are made. These are all made on raw linen with acrylic and oil. And um, again, the hand motif. But I think, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Anne, for giving us a platform and um, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm already seeing connections. I'm like mentally mind reading other people that are gonna talk and seeing things that are like, it's crazy. So. Um, but I'll leave a lot of those connections to be made by the viewer and the other speakers. Um, in alphabetical order, next we have a cloud of awesomeness floating in from Los Angeles, Mr. Joshua Cloud. The I am. Josh. Hello. Oh wow, that's me. That's, that's my name. <laughs> um, yeah, hi. Thank you, Anne, for doing this. It's really nice to still, like, I don't know, to see everybody and to have some semblance of kind of, yeah, like a celebration for this amazing show. Um, I knew Lemon from um, CESA, which was the summer camp that we all did at CalArts, our junior year of high school. Um, we had, yeah, like plans to go to school together to kind of like, have some sort of, you know, I don't know, I felt like our lives were definitely meant to be intertwined in many ways. Um, I think, yeah, um, sorry, it's just kind of like. Sorry, I actually realized I have the old version. Hang on, this is such oh. a fail. So give me one second, I just have to switch you, Josh, to the other. Mm. I can keep talking. Can you talk um, to Ben? Yeah, um, yeah, so I've kind of had a crazy artistic journey over the past like four years. I was going into 
I go to CalArts right now and originally I went to CalArts for character animation, which is like a very industry driven um, animation program that CalArts houses. That's like the one that everyone wants to go to to work at like Disney or Pixar. Um, and I spent one year in that program and in that year I kind of was just always looking at the other programs at the school and seeing how much creative freedom and liberties they were allowed um, to have and kind of with that the grass is always greener mentality. Um, the next year applied to switch to experimental animation and really started to find ways to express um, my own kind of, I don't even know, like there was so much possibility and I felt like I had so much to say and I just kind of wanted to spend this very unique time um, free from, I don't know, all of these outside sources to just make and to find out what I really enjoyed doing. Um, and then from there, at the end of second year, um, I really started to get into sculpture and I um, applied and I'm now a double major also in the art school. So I'm doing installations that are sculpture based um, mixed with video and animation I've done in kind of like a very like homey experience where um, animation can be viewed like, yeah, kind of just like not in a cinema, not in like complete darkness and silence with your peers, but alongside people in conversation and in conversation with other works in the room. Um, that, those are the times that I felt the most moved by art is when I'm kind of really existing with it. Um, so yeah, I've been doing a lot of ceramic stuff, which is definitely the hardest thing about COVID and quarantine is not having access to ceramics anymore because that was a very huge part of my practice. Um, I think after Lemon passed, I was really looking for a way to be in the real world, but to have some t some type of meditative practice that could really help me process and work through um, everything that everything that I was feeling. And I found that in ceramics and fiber work. Um, and I really do, yeah. Oh, so yeah, these are um, ceramic tiles. So a lot of like cross interdisciplinary mediums and practices, like these are screen printing family photos onto like ceramic and porcelain slabs. Um, and so I have like, like kind of what that means in the digital age to hold a photo as this physical and at the same time, very fragile thing, but um, a thing that can really like stand the test of time. I guess I'm like interested a lot in archeology span and the idea of um, like someone in the far future digging up these works that are one of the only things to survive, you know, like, like no one's gonna go look through a hard drive or a flash drive. They probably won't make it through any type of big event. But when you go to the museums and look at what represents um, cultures of the old world, you know, it's these very tactile and labor-based practices. Um, and then, I mean, I'm doing fiber stuff. Like this is a rug that I made and I've been making, oh, sorry, I had a timer going. I had, um, I've been doing rug stuff, making, kind of coming back around and mixing in the two cartoon work that got me into art making in the first place, back in these like tactile practices. Um, and now I'm, yeah, just spending time trying to stay sane, um, making baths now, and that's been fun. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think, it's been a, definitely a crazy trajectory and I'm really happy to have that piece up in the show. It was like the first big weaving that I made um, and it definitely gave me a lot of time to think. Oh, but yeah, um, but thank you, Anne, appreciate it. Thank you. Mm, I wanna to touch all of those things so much. All right, and on to our next panelist, uh, Joanne Dugan coming to us from Cape Cod right now. 
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so happy and honored to be here. And Anne, thank you so much for the invitation. And I just want to say that Amos's creative spirit is with me every single day that I work. And I love how his creativity was just endless, endless, endless. And he produced so, so much work. And he's really an inspiration for me. And if I could produce a fraction of what he did, I would be honored because I think he's just, he was amazing and continues to be with all of us. And I am actually gonna talk more about my process, but first I wanna show you what I'm working on right now. These are really hard to show digitally. They are hand cut works each of the images that you see there are individually cut images on their i work with analog photographic process as in old school photo materials and i take them and hack them and do things with them that they weren't necessarily meant to have be used in that way and so each image is individually printed cut mounted and these works are meant to be visual meditations but what I'm really good, so they, many of them can be seen on my website. Um, and what I really, I really want to talk to about is to share my experience of how I made work during the pandemic. I live in New York City. I'm in Cape Cod right now. Um, I had to leave my apartment for emergency reasons. I had a big leak in, in my floor. And I wanted to continue to make work through the pandemic no matter what. So this is me in my studio working the way that I normally work. And I just wanted to give sort of a, a view of that. And um, I ended up having, I couldn't take the subway to get to my studio. So I ended up biking back and forth 105 blocks from Harlem where I live to Union Square where I work. And um, it was really a challenge. And I'm working on a show right now that was originally going to be called Small Works for Quiet Times. And with everything that's happened in the last couple of weeks, um, that title is going to change. <laughs> And the work is going to change. I was doing these very meditative works, mostly to keep myself sane during lockdown. And so those repetitive images that you saw in the beginning are kind of indicative of the kind of work that I do. And so I began this work during the pandemic and a couple times a week, I would ride my bike and I would see things like this that I ended up channeling into my work. Um, the image on the left is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Single person businesses were actually designated as essential businesses. And so I actually was like out on the streets with permission in the city very carefully with gloves and masks. And it was really incredibly powerful, scary, inspiring and there were literally no people on the streets for blocks and blocks and blocks and if you see in the beginning you, you saw in the works in the beginning um i work in grids so i very much like the reference to ad reinhardt made earlier and these are how i worked on the left is my apartment in harlem and I had to make a makeshift studio there, again, working by hand and ke with chemicals and creating these works. And on the right is my makeshift studio in Wellfleet, Massachusetts. And the point being that work, uh, Gerhard Richter says art is the highest form of hope. And I actually kept that quote next to me the entire time I work was working. And I just want to read a paragraph from my artist statement that I'm working on right now. Throughout this journey, which is still ongoing, I realize that the making of these images is not really up to me. In fact, it is the work itself that creates its own life, no matter where I am, how I feel, and what materials I use. The weeks keep passing as I move through various states of physical and emotional upheaval. I just keep following the path the work lays out digging deep to find some sense of stillness as the materials keep transforming themselves in front of me. 
Most days, my troubled mind tries its hardest to convince me to follow it down a dark path. These works are my resistance. Thanks. Amazing. Um, so, yeah, more connections. And uh, next up in alphabetical order, we have, along with the, the cloud, we have a little lamb <laughs> to share her work, not to infantilize anyone, but um, I do feel like everyone here is sort of a little bit of an offspring. Uh, so, Miss Samantha Lamb, you're up. Hi. Um, I also went to CISA with um, Josh Cloud, Josh Bulos, and, uh, and Lemon. Uh, and I'm now a third year student at CalArts for the Experimental Animation Program um, alongside Josh Cloud. <laughs> um, so this is one of the last, very last things I was able to do at school before um, everything shut down. I'm part of a circus performance group called Sludge Muffin and Bugs Bugs. Um, we uh, got to perform at the Experimental Animation Garden Fair um, and we do a roller skating, juggling, and acrobatics act where we do jumps and splits and dance and spit sludge out of our mouths and eat hot dogs um, and um, it was a really, I, we started doing this uh, within the last year um, as kind of a way to, it was just something I love roller skating and uh, Kate, the one in the matching jumpsuit, loves to juggle um, and we just started doing it for fun because we like both of these practices and uh, it's a good way to kind of break out of the uh, monotony of animation. Um, so this was also one of my last classes at CalArts this year um, over Zoom. This was the video graphics class, um, one of the many classes that was really impacted by COVID because it is all these, the process of video graphics involves these massive modular synthesize, uh, synthesizers, <laughs> um, uh, synthesis machines um, that are at CalArts um, that were taken from old newsrooms and various artists who make uh, modular synthesizers. Um, but we found a way to kind of nav like use emulators, digital emulators of the analog technology to continue the class online. Um, oh, this was uh, my final project for uh, this semester, um, since I, the one of the few things I had when school closed was a massive roll of 35 millimeter clear leader. Um, and everything else I had planned for the year went out the window. Um, and I found it really comforting to do this process of painting and scratching into this clear leader. Um, and this is a work in progress, uh, telling the martyrdom of St. Agatha. Um, the, this portion is just kind of about her death and veneration, but the, I think there's much more to be told um, before and after. Um, but yeah, I found this, this was also a very meditative process. Oh, um, this is about my thesis project for CalArts that I've started to research and do the interviews for which is about a kid named Donnie Rose. Um, this photo is from 1978. It was taken when he was 14 years old um, by the singer Alice Bag of the Bags. Um, but he was really heavily involved with the early punk scene in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm working on a documentary project about him for my thesis film. So that's kind of what I've been entrenched in right now. It was just the beginning of researching and interviewing for this project. Um, about him and trying to create a more compassionate uh, memory for him. because I think he's been pretty sorely misremembered um, by, and also just under, uh, there's a lot of pieces of him that I think are, haven't been told yet um, about him and then also 
his life in the punk scene. Um, this is my house <laughs> and my cat, Artie. Um, I'm in a borrowed bed right now at Josh Cloud's house, but this is where I normally am. Um, and also where I've been doing a lot of the emailing for interviews and researching over the last couple of months. Um, and also taking my classes. And <laughs> um, so I wanted to, but I don't have any photos of a studio because um, that's, all of that was left at school. So I've included my bed and my cat. Um, yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, that was super interesting. And um, for everyone who's watching and listening, don't forget on the website, there's links to, uh, to Sammy's work on Vimeo and her, her latest film from last year has been winning a bunch of prizes and is super interesting. So look forward to more. And um, let's see, alphabetically, we're in the lemon category. So this is uh, purely coincidental. This young lady actually is related to me, so I will let her speak. And she's probably Amos' earliest artist influence. Hang on, I'm unmuted now. Okay, now am I there? Okay, all right. Um, so this is uh, really, really great, and um, it's so wonderful to see all of the of the work for these other panelists too. Because I've seen a few things online, but hearing them talk about it, it's really it's great, and um, I just applaud them all for all of their effort. And as Joanne said, if we could each have you know a fraction of the effort that that Amos had, um, we would all be doing really well. And, and from what I can see, everybody is doing really well. So um, anyway, Anne, you wanna roll it? Yeah. So this is um, a triptych and I call this the three times. And it represents the, uh, the future and the present and the past. And th this is kind of about how experience changes as you as time moves through you and as you move through time. So on the left, it's the future, which is kind of black and white. And, and then in the middle, it's the present. So it represents the kind of direct experience of any particular thing that might happen. In this case, just a just you know, seeing a, a bird walking down the beach, um, just that instant. Uh, and then the right hand is what happens after the direct per perception when whatever, you, whatever happened to you starts to um, be distorted by your emotional reaction to it and by your interpretation of it and, and uh, it starts to fade into your memory. And so this is just kind of about time and it's about that process. And then the other thing that I was interested in that was just the fact that the bird also is walking into its own future in present and past. And so the idea that, you know, that's going on in, in parallel with our own experience. Um, and so this one is, uh, based on a photograph from my very good friend, Karen Summers. And um, this is a ongoing investigation that I'm doing, which is to try and um, kind of integrate drawing and painting into one process. And I, I'm trying various experimental things to make that happen. And, so in this case, um, uh, you know, well, in that earlier one, <laughs> I, um, I drew with ink and then painted over it. And this is another example where I worked with a lot of heavy layers of oil paint and then scratched back into the bottom layer to create the lines. And I'm 
kind of trying to make the space a, to talk about the three dimensional actual space, but also the physical reality of the paper itself and, and how it has its own completely flat space that um, has a lot of reference to, as we can see in this painting, uh, it, for me, it has a lot of reference to the vertical because it's just, it's kind of like everything falls downhill if you're on a flat surface. And, and especially if that flat surface is sitting up vertically on the wall, then, you know, I'm always interested in the vertical. Um, and this one is oil on canvas. And again, it's trying to integrate the line and the and painting and also basically integrate the the negative space of the canvas with the positive space so that the shapes are, you know, some of the important shapes are positive shapes and some of them are negative shapes. And it kind of also that direct, that uh, automatic drawing idea from the Dadaists who, who loved that idea. And then it wouldn't be a lemon show if I didn't have my lemon paintings. So this is um, a, a painting I, I um, did because I, I bought this new tube of color, which is called cadmium yellow lemon. And it's such an awesome color. And I went out and I bought some lemons so that I could uh, paint this painting. And, and uh I, and i set them up and then i kind of looked at them for a long time and and they sort of began to take on a personality to me and um so this one i call best friends and uh I, there's a little anatomical reference to it's been pointed out but um but this is also an homage to amos because he was such a his free he had such a free spirit in, in with his work and he always um, he tackled everything just completely and everything seemed to come together for him somewhat effortlessly and and uh, so you know we miss him and uh, I'm so happy that Anne that you've put together this show and you got all these great people. Uh, it's thanks. Yeah, I have noticed. I feel like you've been uh, kind of like taking it up a notch. I, I don't know. There's something going on out there. You've been like spitting out the work. So it's something. Yeah. Something. Not too much else to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. I don't know. I can find a lot of distractions. All right, and then coming circling back around to good old uh, Indiana. The the. Uh, the natal land of lemon, whether he knew it or not, is Mr. Speck Mellencamp, who I believe is coming from out to us somewhere outside of Bloomington, crazily enough. So Speck, welcome to the park. Hello, can you hear me? I can't, I've never, never used Zoom before. Um, all right, so these are the uh, last five paintings. Oh, I was uh, roommates with Lemon for a little bit. Um, good times. All right, so these are the last five paintings I've done, like big paintings um, since, you know, lockdown. Um, I thought, okay, so this one was two, three weeks ago. I've been thinking a lot about like positions of power in painting, um, sort of nudity, not as like a weakness, sort of like, I don't know, it's weird. You feel, you feel weird being naked sometimes, you know? But turning that around, having the, uh, being naked, Losing your sound a little bit into the wind. There, so oh, sorry. I'm on my phone, uh, and yeah. I just I just put my finger over mm -hmm. the uh, the mic, so that's my bad. That's all right. Um, 
on it. I'm not, I'm not seeing, oh, there it is. Okay, so this is the one I'm working on right now. I just started this the night all the protests happened. I don't really, you know, like to, like, make political art, you know? I'm, I'm not one to do that. Um, this isn't finished. I actually completely changed it. But, like, I wouldn't say that this is, like, a direct response, but sort of, like, more my reaction to everything. Um, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't like to get political, but it's sort of hard not to respond to what's going on in the world sometimes. Um, this, I've been looking at a lot of Picasso's paintings, and this is actually from life. This is my, uh, well, it's my girlfriend. She, uh, she stood there for a very long time. Very cool. Um, and then, yeah, I just sort of made up. What's going on in the back? This, uh, yeah, nothing really more to say about that one. This was the first painting I did since lockdown started. Uh, so every time I try to, or I decide to make a painting, I like to do something differently. And so for this one, like, I've been really the start, like, how do you start a painting? You know, like, plan it out. So for this one, I actually worked more on like prep work and longer on prep work than I did the actual painting. And uh, yeah, I decided I don't really like that too much just because I feel like sort of it loses some of its feeling. And you know, you've, you've all made paintings. They never go how you plan. So, all right. So, so that one, I did a bunch of preparatory drawings. This one, I actually just drew on the canvas and then tried and then used uh, shellac and I think it's called like gel, some sort of clear stuff over it instead of gesso. Um, most of my paintings, you know, I don't name them until I have to. And I just, you know, this one I kind of like, this is like the only painting I've ever made that um, I had a name for while I was making it. And uh, it's the, the, mayor's, the mayor's parade. Only one, I don't know why, just, just was. Um, and that's it. All right. I didn't mean to cut you off. I don't know if you're about to say something no, else. No, that was it. Is, right. that a, is that the mayor of Bloomington there? Or is that what we're looking at here? Um, uh, no, no. I just, you know, made it up. It reminds me a lot of the circus -y piece that's in the, uh, that's in the show. It's like a yeah. yeah, it's related. Like crazy circus of life. All righty. Um, and speaking of a crazy circus of life, that's uh, what you're going to see from Mr. Joey Strain coming up. Um, I think uh, when I hung up the show, there was a, a kind of a nice little conversation that was happening between the work of Joey and Speck. They seem to be talking, the, the creatures and people seem to be talking to each other literally from the paint. So um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Joey. Hi, I'm Joey. Uh, first of all, thanks to Anne for setting up this whole show. It's been really magical to see uh, everybody's work and how they look at each other and uh, I've been like really into Amos's stuff ever since I saw like what he would put in the front of like his middle school binder. So I've been like a massive fan since like uh, the eighth grade. And it's really uh, pretty important to me to be able to have my stuff still showing with his uh, after all this time. Um, so ever since the uh, um, quarantine time, I've kind of just been doing like everything. I have a really short attention span with stuff and I kind of just make like different stuff constantly. A lot of times just don't finish it. A lot of things laying around. Um, this, for example, uh, I'm really into like uh, illustration and I hope to go into like children's book illustrating in the future. So this has kind of been like a side project of just kind of trying to make up my own like little alphabet book. So just kind of, uh, I'm really into like the forests and the woods going out and uh, experiencing in nature. And I think that uh, it's good to kind of keep that good with uh, uh, children these days, so I kind of wanted to create a bunch of like woodland characters as a book. Uh, 
I've been doing a lot of experimenting with like paint. You know, I'm not like a, a super good painter and it's probably what I've done the, the least of uh, in my life. But over this quarantine, I've kind of been doing a lot of painting with like acrylics, but then also mixing like uh, what I usually do, like line art and like markers. So it's really fun to kind of experiment with like how acrylic paint kind of works with uh, alcohol ink or maybe if it doesn't work uh, and how it works with like India ink and all that type of stuff. Um, so I've just kind of been working on canvas and kind of just coming up with whatever comes to mind. I do it a lot of like uh, big nosed characters for some reason. I find that a very interesting thing to do. Uh, just like uh, mysterious people, large noses. Um, this is another painting that I worked on. Uh, that's sort of, uh, I'm really into frogs. I kind of go out and like uh, look for frogs intentionally because I really appreciate them. And uh, that along with like a lot of the other kind of um, less appreciated animals out there like insects and amphibians and all that kind of stuff that you kind of have to like crouch down and kind of search for. And uh, so this was kind of just like a, a kind of painting that I wanted to capture kind of like the childhood wonderment of like experiencing the little things in nature that you really don't notice that often. Uh, a big, another big theme in my work is like pointy hats. Uh, so that's an important part of that one too. Um, this piece, I really, you know, I started out just kind of like with that goofy smiley face and just like, that was kind of the emotion I was feeling at the time. And I wanted to kind of capture kind of like a, something that was like kind of cute and nice to look at, but it's also kind of like a big monster. And uh, I was kind of trying to, I like to kind of uh, mix cute and weird and creepy all at the same time, I think is kind of something that's important to me. And uh, I think this little big fish character is, uh, I don't know, he's very cute. I really enjoyed making him and kind of, uh, this is another exciting piece because it kind of got to show mixes of different types of inks and paints together. Uh, another thing that I've been doing a lot is kind of uh, while I'm out, uh, just kind of walking around trying to spend my time outdoors is kind of uh, do sort of like uh, nature, still life type of things from life studies. So I found this uh, bird wing just lying in my yard and uh, for some reason it really spoke to me and it kind of like affected me and I wanted to recreate it, kind of show it. Uh, just like the things that you think less about in nature is like the death, you know, where do those, all those little critters out there go? A lot of times you don't find out, but then sometimes you'll come across, you know, uh, just a bird's wing. And uh, you know, this was one of those times where I felt a connection to that and wanted to kind of uh, recreate it and uh, give it more meaning. Goes by fast. Um, beautiful and emotional and uh, a very smooth connection with our next artist, uh, Miss Kaylin Williams. Um, she's our youngest artist, and, uh, but I think equally interesting at this point. And uh, she'll take us through to the end. Hi, uh, I'm Kaylin. I'm a rising sophomore at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. Um, I was very surprised and also honored when Anne asked me to be a part of the show um, for the reason that I'm not sure if Amos ever knew who I even was um, because I was just a freshman um, and I looked up to Amos a lot as an artist. Me and my friend Tara every single day after art class would go out into the hallway before lunch and we would look at specifically his art and Joey's art who just came before me. Um, and we were late to lunch like every day and kept getting in trouble, but we kept doing it because it was just so beautiful. Um, so here's a photo of my workspace. I'm very, I'm very much a maximalist. Um, I like to be surrounded by things that bring me inspiration and joy. Um, and I will admit that it's not always this tidy, um, but I do like to have my paints in rainbow order. That is a fact. So I like to have all of my art on my wall from different people that inspire me. Um, and that just brings me so much joy in my space for my work. Um, so this first painting I did um, sort of mid quarantine, it's about the feeling that I was having, I'm not sure if anyone else relates, of sort of the blur between indoor and outdoor during quarantine. 
and that feeling of like losing the freedom and the naturalness of the outdoors when you have to be so cautious about your surroundings instead of feeling free. Um, so I wanted to create this environment that was a little bit confusing, like is she indoors, is she outdoors, and also feels very produced and plasticky, as in like maybe she's not in a real place. <laughs> So in my mind, um, she didn't choose to be in that environment. She was kind of forced into it. Um, this is a series I did for a final. Um, it's titled, Am I Pretty Yet? So um, I'm very interested in imagining like the classic monsters and things, but if they were just regular people. Um, so this is, of course, the creature from the Black Lagoon, but what if she was a girl in the 1950s and she was getting ready for prom and she was struggling to feel beautiful because she's this weird lizard creature and so how is she supposed to fit into these beauty standards when she has scales and her skin is green um so it's the series of her looking for her inspiration in 17 magazine trying on her makeup trying to feel beautiful and then finally that's her looking in the mirror before she goes out the door um and i had a lot of fun with this piece so yeah, and I think it's a little bit funny as well. Um, this is what I'm currently working on. It's a series for a commission. Um, the girl who commissioned me, I actually did a painting of her when I was a junior in high school, and she's been a very big supporter of mine ever since then, but she um, could never afford to commission me until recently. Um, and she was redecorating her room and wanted a series of five of um, pieces inspired by like vintage Halloween illustrations. So I did a little bit of thinking in the noggin and I was like, hmm, what are the things that I should do? What are the things that really represent this? So I, I was feeling more of like the fortune telling, the crystal ball, the palmist tree, a moth, and the two that are not here yet are a skull with crystals growing off of it and a witch's boots with some purple flowers, perhaps belladonnas or nightshade. Okay, so that actually wraps up um, our, our panelists, our little five minute speed round. Um, I uh, would like to uh, turn it over. There's a couple questions coming in. And um, also to remind everybody, amoslemon.org, I should have put that on the slide. Our, our, um, our tagline is stay alive, make art, and everyone has done an amazing job of that during this crazy time. I love seeing how the determination of all of these artists um, it, to continue making and the inspiration, you know, I don't know, I was like just curled up in a fetal position, so I didn't really do anything <laughs> creative. <laughs> until very recently. So I'm, I'm amazed and, um, and just, just astounded and amazed at everything that everyone's done. And I know that uh, I have my uh, friend, Mr. Dane would like to say a couple words. Are you there? I will unmute you. I think you're, you're ready to talk, Mr. Um. Dane? I don't know if I'm videoed. Am I videoed? I don't know where I am. I don't know. Uh, start video on your screen. I did. It says, yeah, I did. I did. Mute. Okay. Well, here I am. You can hear me. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the artists. I love you all. And what you're doing is amazing. And all the, all the attendees, too. Um, most of you probably know me, but if not, I'm Amos's dad or Lemon's dad. Um, and just thank you to everyone. I appreciate this. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we have uh, a lot of interest from the from the uh, audience about the first piece of Josh Clouds, that neck neck ornament. So, if you can talk to us a little bit about that, and then uh, another thing I want to think about, just put it out there for the presenters, is the question about how the artist responded to the other presenters. So, if there's something between each of you. Um, you might want to think about that, but uh, in the meantime, Mr. Josh, talk to us about the, uh, the oh. neckwear. Yeah, um, well, I guess I like to rabbit hole into like techniques and stuff, and um, that was actually 
how you would make friendship bracelets. Oh wait, I have like a small one lying right here. Like something like this, just like uh, it's called Kumi Kimo. You just have a disc and you move the individual strands of yarn. And so when I was bored one day, I started making these ropes and then I started making bigger ropes. And then I was like, what if I put, um, like wire inside of the rope. And I started making ropes that could be posable for animation. Um, and then I was like, what if I make a form and then make a rope or a bracelet around that? And so I started making these lumpy ones that also had wire in them. Um, and then it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I made that one. Her name is Lurch actually, um, named after this, the world record holding like bull with the biggest horns in the world. And I was watching a video of that and I was like, these look like these horns. And so um, Lurch was kind of like what I call the zero maintenance um, therapy animal or therapy pet. Like I could wear her as like a neck pillow or like I would just walk around school with it as a sash type of thing. It has like beads on it that you can roll if you're feeling anxious. Um, it's just kind of like something you can pose around. Like if I was sitting in the cafeteria alone, I would like put her in a chair like across from me and like form the wire into kind of like a head shape. And so it's just kind of this fun experiment with how like through art making, you can make kind of a companion to help you get through um, tougher times. If you and don't have a friend here, you can knit a friend. Yeah, totally. Uh, totally but yeah, it's definitely, it's still here with me. It's in my garage studio right now. But um, yeah, it was definitely a fun experiment that I want to do more stuff like. There's like a couple, they're like siblings. They all have names. But Lurch is like the, like, like the golden child. Like, all, like, I don't tell the others, but she's obviously my favorite. <laughs> Um, for anyone who hasn't had a chance, check out Josh's uh, animated, animated growing leaves and, and, and fiber. It's amazing combination of animation and, and fiber on, uh, there's a link to, on the website. So, so let's hear from artists. Anything that you would like to um, uh, refer back to each other? Uh, and there's also an, an empty... Um, question out here or an unanswered question of right now everyone's affected by the quarantine but if it ended tomorrow and things became normal again would the quarantine still affect your production or would you just change directions so maybe um i'll just uh anybody who who feels like talking unmute themse themselves and give it a whirl i can yeah. give a quick answer oh go ahead no, i'm just gonna say actually um that question in particular because the work that I do is so multi-layered and I use photo references and then I'll go into Photoshop and layer them like that one image that's kind of that I showed at the end of the statue with the mask on it and how it's chained to the actual stone that will be transferred onto you know of course a painting but how I collage and how I work recently and how I've done that it's like I want it to end so I can get to the end as far as what's going on because it just right now the environment's just changing so much with what you see in the news and do I include medical workers do I include because now you got two different things going on so do you blend those things or do you change the initial idea? And, um, you know, I've been collecting images, but it's just, it's hard to say. I think if it stopped, I think I'd be producing more because it's like, that's the period. So now I know exactly what I want to say with it. Um, but as far as studies and stuff like that go, uh, I'm not sure. It's it's kind of a difficult question, but I think it I think it would be because there'd be a little bit more normalcy. So it's like, oh, okay, I can 
not float around as much. I can dedicate this to this and this to this, and I don't need to kind of float to scrap together money to pay rent and things like that. So I can dedicate a lot of time to work and what it all means as far as what I want to say. Um, that's just, that's just me chiming in. So. Uh, who else is piping up, Joanne? Oh, I just wanted to say really quickly, it's a great question about production and the quarantine. And I just have been sort of thinking about that for a second. And what I have discussed, I did a residency last year. Uh, I was in a dune shack in the middle of sand dunes in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and I had no electricity or running water. And I made work in those conditions. And I realized there that I actually work better under what I call restricted conditions. And obviously the quarantine was a very restricted con condition. And I've really come to realize that setting parameters for making art and not being super open-ended with everything that I'm doing is actually, and if you look at my work, which is very much about grids and they're very ordered. Um, so I wanna continue this idea of fewer options it sounds really strange to say but the quarantine really taught me what was really really important to me and i made choices accordingly so i think my production will probably go down i'm very very productive in restricted conditions and in a strange way i want to replicate that mindset moving forward even when the whole world opens up yeah. Um, that's an interesting point. You might want to, um, other artists, you, I, I hope that you all um, have each other's contact information and I can share it. And uh, the idea of doing a residency, I feel like we've all done a little artist residency during this time. Well, that, I actually named mine the Pandemic Epicenter <laughs> Artist Residency yeah. that I gave to myself. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's like I said at the beginning, not everyone is like you nine people that if you were trapped in a cave, you would find a way to make art by rubbing two rocks together. I'm just saying, like, not everyone responded to the quarantine by like, I know, I'll make a bunch of stuff. It's really freaking cool. So and we're um, all making it in Amos's honor and he was there with us the whole time. Well, that's appreciated. Yeah, uh, it, it's beyond. Um, so we're a little bit past time. I was going to try to wrap it up by 8.11. Um, there's a question out about Joey. Have you ever animated any of your work? And I know that you did a little bit, right? Yeah, I did a little tiny hand-drawn animation because I've always been really interested in like hand-drawn animation. It's really like one of my biggest inspirations. It's just kind of like old animations and just kind of like how you can make something that was made in real life kind of move. And uh, I, I've done like one little one with like a little uh, caterpillar guy, but it was only like five seconds long and I haven't done it since, but it's definitely something that I, I'm interested in and will hopefully even do in the future. And uh, Joyce works on a, a, another children's book that's an amazing, it is like a film. So I think that process of make, book making is, is animation, you know, you know in a frozen form yeah so um any anybody want to fling in a last minute comment I'm very impressed by how articulate everyone is um artists a lot of times we like to talk in visuals and um everyone was so clear and and it was fascinating to me to look inside of all of your minds and uh i did I did feel like you were all connected by, there were some themes of digital versus tactile and that struggle to be in the tactile world in a digital environment. I feel like everyone is working on that in some way or form. And I also felt that's the questions of like structure and unstructure and uh, grids and non-grids and reacting to, to, uh, reacting to the world and interpreting it yourself and art as a meditative process was coming through. So um, I hope that our audience enjoyed it. I'm gonna put the recording up on our website and please tune into these artists and contact them, look at their work. They're all amazing and I love you all. And I'll see you in person sometime soon. This, our show that was gonna open tonight is 
postponed until next year. So hopefully June of 2021, we will see each other again. So bye everyone.